How and why would a loving God allow somebody to spend eternity in the flames of hell for dying in mortal sin? Hi, I'm Dave Palmer. That's the question we're going to talk about today. And the very, very last question of the Summa Theologia before St. Thomas Aquinas goes into what he calls the appendix, which is only a few questions at the very, very end, mostly about purgatory. The very last question, Thomas talks about the justice and mercy of the damned in hell, the damned demons and also the damned souls in hell. It is a teaching of our Catholic faith and certainly a teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas that some people, maybe a lot of people, end up in eternal hellfire. Okay, so how do we reconcile that with what we have all been taught as Catholic Christians, that God is love? In fact, it says that a couple of times at least in John's first epistle, 1 John, God is love, and we also know that God is justice. Okay, God is a God of justice, and so this is how we know that some people, if they die objectively in, 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 a mortal, in a state of mortal sin, they are going to spend eternity in hell. And it's a really, really hard teaching to accept. At least for me, I struggle with this a lot. Eternal damnation, never-ending damnation. And uh, we don't know exactly what hell is, but it is separation from God. And uh, we also know that God is a God of mercy. And so how do we reconcile that? A God who allows some people to spend eternity in hell while still being a God of love and a God of mercy. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about in uh, this question from uh, the Summa Theologia. Again, the very, very last question in the Summa before the appendix. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, by the way, it's uh, it, it's the, the append it's the supplement question 99, the very last one. Okay, all I'm going to read is the body or corpus of what St. Thomas Aquinas says about this. And it's kind of long, but it's also got a lot of interesting information. And I can't imagine a lot of more important things to think about, to ponder about, to pray about than, uh, you know, something that potentially could happen to any one of us, could happen to our loved ones, is that we spend eternity in hell. Okay, so here is how hell is typically depicted. It's always red and it's you know, fire and brimstone and agony and pain. And it's just, it's very, very unpleasant, regardless of how, how it is uh, described. And so here is the question that Thomas asks. He says, whether by divine justice, an eternal punishment is inflicted on sinners. All right, so let's go through this kind of slowly. And I want to explain it as we go along. He says in the corpus, I answer that since punishment is measured in two ways, namely according to the degree of its severity and according to its length of time, the measure of punishment corresponds to the measure of fault as regards the degree of severity so that the more grievously a person sins, the more grievously is he punished. Okay, so I don't think anybody would argue with that. And then he quotes scripture as much as she hath glorified herself in living in delicacies, so much torment and sorrow ye give to her. Okay, so there seems to be a correspondence between the way we live and then how we're going to spend our, uh, our eternity, and that's from the Apocalypse or Revelation 18.7. The duration of the punishment does not, however, correspond with the duration of the fault, as Augustine says, for adultery, which is committed in a short space of time, is not punished with a momentary penalty even according to human laws but the duration of punishment regards the disposition of the sinner all right so interesting here he says that and i think we can all agree with that discipline is going to be either intensely painful or it's going to go over a long period of time think about the way children are often punished okay they may get a spanking which happens very quickly but it's it's quick i mean it's very painful but it's quick or they might go you got to go in your room or you're grounded for a weekend. Okay, that's not as painful, but it's over a long period of time, right? And so he says here, adultery, you know, happens very quickly, but the, the, the punishment could be more severe. Somebody goes and steals a car and it takes them, you know, 10 minutes and they might spend a, a year in prison, you know. So the, the, the correspondence of time doesn't always match up. That's what he's saying here, right? All right. For sometimes a person who commits an offense in a city is rendered by his very offense worthy of being cut off entirely from the fellowship of citizens, either by perpetual exile or even by death. Whereas sometimes he is not rendered worthy of being cut off entirely from the fellowship of citizens. Okay, so interesting here, Thomas is using 
an example that we can relate to, okay, where people might be do something so bad. It happens in our day and age where somebody does something really egregious and they get thrown in prison for life or they get cut off from the community for, you know, an, an extended period of time, right? All right, so um, wherefore, in order that he may become a fitting member of the state, his punishment is prolonged or curtailed according as is expedient for his amendment, so that he may live in a city in a becoming and peaceful manner. Okay, so sometimes somebody goes to prison for a certain amount of time, they get rehabilitated, and then they come back. Okay, but the, what he's saying here is that the, the amount of time is often dependent upon the, the nature of the crime that they have uh, committed, right? So too, according to divine justice, sin renders a person worthy to be altogether cut off from the fellowship of God's city, and this is the effect of every sin committed against charity. Okay, these are mortal sins, which is the bond uniting this same city together. Okay, so the bond that unites the people of God, the people of, of, the, of heaven together is charity. So when, when, when one breaks that bond of charity, they are not allowed to be amongst the people in heaven. Okay, that, that's what, what Tom, uh, Thomas is saying here. Um, okay, consequently, for mortal sin, which is contrary to charity, a person is expelled forever from the fellowship of the saints and condemned to everlasting punishment because, as Augustine says, as men are cut off from this perishable city by the penalty of the first death, so they are excluded from that imperishable city by punishment of the second death. Okay, so again, interesting, Augustine, you know, writes City of God and City of Man, City of God. <clears throat> so um, Thomas is probably taking from that because Augustine lived many centuries before Aquinas. All right, so comparing it to something we can relate to, all right, the punishment that criminals get in regard to their being able to associate with people in a city. All right, he goes on, that the punishment inflicted by the earthly state is not deemed everlasting is accidental, either because man endures not forever or because the state itself comes to an end. Wherefore, if man lived forever, the punishment of exile or slavery, which is pronounced by human law, would remain in him forever. On the other hand, as regards those who sin in such a way as to not to deserve to be entirely cut off from the fellowship of the saints, such as those who sin venially, their punishment will be so much the shorter or longer according as they are more or less fit to be cleansed, though sin, uh, through sin clinging to them less or more. This is observed in the punishment of this world and of purgatory according to divine justice. Okay, um, So yeah, interesting point here, where if we lived forever on this earth, life sentences would be forever, <laughs> you know? The only reason a life sentence is typically, you know, 50, 60 years is because the person dies or the world is going to come to an end as well. So I think that's a very interesting point that he makes, uh, comparing, again, our life here to the punishment for eternal salvation, right? We find also other reasons given by the saints why some are justly condemned to everlasting punishment for a temporal sin. One is because they sinned against an eternal good, by disposing, d despising eternal life. This is mentioned by Augustine. He has become worthy of eternal evil who destroyed in himself a good which could be eternal. Another reason is because man sinned in his own eternity, wherefore Gregory says it belongs to the great justice of the judge that those should never cease to be punished who in this life never cease to desire sin. And if it be objected that some who sin mortally propose to amend their life at some time, and that these accordingly and seemingly are not deserving of eternal punishment, it must be replied according to some that Gregory speaks of the will that is made manifest by the deed. Okay, so, um, okay, so when, when, one, when one sins against God, when one cuts off charity, one is aware, if, if they are aware, that they have now forfeited eternal life, okay, because of an attraction to a mutable good, all right? So everybody is told this. I mean, everybody, unless they're invincibly ignorant, knows <laughs> the rules, right? Uh, and so uh, really there's no excuse. You stay in a state of grace. Don't, don't fall into mortal sin. For he who falls into mortal sin of his own will puts himself in a state whence he cannot be rescued except God help him. 
Wherefore, from the very fact that he is willing to sin, he is willing to remain in sin forever. For man is a wind that goeth, namely to sin, and returneth not by his own power. Thus, if a man were to throw himself into a pit, whence he could not get out of without help, one might say that he wished to remain there forever, what, uh, whatever else uh, he may have thought himself. Another and a better answer is that from the very fact that he commits a mortal sin, he places his end in a creature, and since the whole life is directed to its end, it follows that for this very reason he directs the whole of his life to that sin and is willing to remain in sin forever if he could do so with impunity. So again, we don't have a lot of excuse because we've all been told, and the only way one can be damned forever is if you willingly commit a mortal sin, knowing full well that it's a mortal sin and knowing full well what the consequences would be. Okay, that's, those are the, the conditions of sin, right? This is what Gregory says in Job 41.23. He shall esteem the deep as growing old. The wicked only put an end to sinning because their life came to an end. They would indeed have wished to live forever, that they might continue to sin forever, if they desire rather to sin than to live. Still another reason may be given why the punishment of mortal sin is eternal, because thereby one offends God who is infinite. Wherefore, since punishment cannot be infinite in intensity, because the creature is incapable of an, intensi an infinite quality, it must needs be infinite at least in duration. And again, there is a fourth reason for the same because guilt remains forever since it cannot be remitted without grace and men cannot receive grace after death and should, and, nor should punishment cease so long as guilt remains. Okay, so Thomas has given a lot of good and good reasons here. Okay, guilt remains. Uh, you know, if people... If people sin all the way to the end of their life, Thomas is saying, well, you, they, would, they would sin eternally if they could, right? The only reason they stop sinning is because they die. And so these people are worthy of eternal punishment. All right, so um, let me know, does that in your mind reconcile a loving God with a God who is willing to allow somebody to live eternally in damnation and the other thing that i would just say from a personal standpoint is god sets the rules okay and god is kind enough to at least let us know the rules and we know that if we die in a state of mortal sin we're going to be eternally punished in hell and so none of us really has much of an excuse so i hope this helps you understand how a good god could and does allow some and perhaps many to suffer eternally in the fires of hell. Thanks for watching. God bless you.